Hi YouTubers. Today I'd like to talk about a subject. It refers to a video I recently uploaded um, saying, you know, the five things that you're probably practicing incorrectly and how to correct them. And I listed five things and, and uh, the next thing on this list I want to talk about is how to learn and practice jazz patterns. Now, um, the interesting thing about that is, is so, um, usually, uh, I'll ask you, are you still doing this? Are you practicing jazz patterns in isolation? And are you practicing them in all 12 keys at once? Now, let me ask you this question. Do you ever wonder why it takes so long before the licks or patterns come out spontaneously in your solos? If you could say yes to any of these questions, I could tell you why it's not effective. Because first of all, you're making three mistakes here, at least three. But I say three mistakes that I can think of. One is because you're practicing the patterns in isolation. Two is that you're practicing them in all 12 keys. Just bear with me. And you're concentrating more on input rather than output. Now, I like to tackle each problem. Uh, I like to tackle each problem. First of all, practicing patterns in isolation. What do I mean by practicing patterns in isolation? What do I mean by that? When you practice uh, a, a pattern alone, with or without a metronome, or a play along, or anything like that, if you're doing it over and over again, you'll get it under your fingers, but you won't be able to really possibly won't be able to use it right away if playing a solo. Just think for, for a minute. What is the purpose of learning jazz patterns at all? Yeah, we want to learn to improvise by expanding our repertoire. We want to learn more musical ideas. We want to have more ammunition, you know, so to say, when, we, when we're playing. We intend to use material while we're improvising. But uh, how is that supposed to work if you don't give the pattern a framework to be used in. In other words, why don't you practice the patterns in a way that you would use them at the end? You know? So what I mean is here is that when you're practicing something in isolation, that means you're just practicing the pattern just without a metronome or with a metronome. But if it's just like, say, let's say if you're practicing a 2-5-1 pattern, and you're playing a play along that just have two five one the same two five one going over and over again. It's fine. It's closer to where you want to use it, but it's still not you know the end the end game. The thing is, the best way is to actually practice that pattern with a tune. Practice it with a standard that you're working on. Uh, I like to suggest um, doing it this way. If we take an easy uh, form like the blues or maybe even rhythm changes, you know, depending on what the pattern is that you're learning or any other type of tune or a tune like tune up, for instance. Choose that one pattern, first of all, just one key that you want to use it in, you know, maximum two, okay? And choose that one key and play the play along. And first of all, don't solo to the track. Just wait for that one point, one or two points, whatever it is in the tune, that where you want to use that pattern. And the first time you run through the play along, just play that pattern only at that place where you intended to work. Now the next step, after you've done that, during the second chorus, play a little bit solo, but be mindful of where you are. And then, when it comes to that place in the tune where you want to use that pattern, Play that pattern. The next chorus, you could improvise, you know, you could keep soloing, make it a little bit more uh, intricate, but then now you're going to try to play something that will lead in to that, lead into that pattern that you want to use, and also how you can get out of it. See, the main thing is here, I'm giving the pattern a framework where it should come, which should actually happen when you're actually playing a solo. Because the thing is, you're not going to play, most of the time, you're not probably going to play a pattern just isolated in a solo. You're going to be playing something beforehand that will lead into this pattern. You'll be playing something that comes afterward. And this is the main reason why 
Trust practicing patterns in isolation, just by themselves, without a without a, the framework of a t of any type of tune, any type of standard that you're using, any type of situation where you're going to be using that pattern. It makes it more difficult to be able to use it in a situation spontaneously. If you're going to use patterns, you have to purposely use it. Now. Why uh, not practice in all 12 keys at once? I say, well, first of all, more than likely, whatever pattern that you're going to be using, you're probably not going to use it in all 12 keys. You know, it all depends on how your technique is, you know, how often you actually play in those keys and things like that. But actually, we want to be able to play in all keys. But the main thing is most of the time, you're going to be playing in a certain set of keys. Most standards are going to be written, uh, you know, the same you're going to play at any jam session or any gig is going to be you know, available only in a certain uh, set of keys. You know, and if you're playing with a singer, it could be a couple more keys too that it might be uh, unusual. So anyway, um, practicing all 12 keys at once. Well, let me ask you this: which is better, practicing one pattern in all 12 keys, or practicing 12 patterns in one key? Now, I believe that the latter is a good idea, but I wouldn't suggest that you try to do 12 different patterns at once, at least not at first. Cut it down to about six and learn to really hear better in one key. Like for instance, if I decide to work on a blues in A flat, for instance, then maybe I should try to learn a handful of patterns that I can use in a blues in A flat rather than try to learn this one super cool lick in 12 different keys. Really concentrate on learning to play in that one key. Well, three, too much input, not enough output. This is a big issue because we've learned to actually do this in school. I say, think back to when you were in your foreign language class, whether that was junior high school or high school. You learned vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, etc. And you've done this for a number of years, maybe two years, maybe four years. Now, the question here is, can you speak the language with any fluency? Can you at least, at least ask directions? Can you order a coffee? Do you understand what people are saying to you? My guess is that you did not learn how to speak that foreign language fluently or you can't even order a cup of coffee. Why? Too much concentration on input, vocabulary, and grammar, and not enough time spent on output, which is actually speaking the language. And this is what we got to do with uh, the, the patterns or any licks that we're, we're trying to tune or tune. We have to concentrate not only on the input, but we should be concentrating at least twice as much on output to actually playing those patterns, those licks, using those patterns and licks in tunes, spending much more time, much more time, and to be able to integrate them into our playing. We want to build a repertoire, and that, but in order to build a repertoire, you have to play the tunes, not just learn the tunes and, and, and have a, and have your real book and stuff like that and, and, and real book and your fake books and have all these tunes available to you, you have to play them in order to learn them in order to have them part of your repertoire. And so you have to um, find ways to um, perform these patterns as often as possible, you know, as much as possible. One of the methods that I've also used to work patterns Many years ago, I had really the, the great pleasure to, to study privately with saxophonist Steve Grossman. And he had introduced to me a method of improving my improvisation by actually writing out solos. Not transcribing, thinking about solos. And I say thinking them up and actually writing them out and really concentrating on, on writing the stuff that would really concentrate on writing out not just things that work, things that actually sound good, things that I would want to really play at the end of it, and only write that and nothing less. You could have like a C7 chord, you know what the notes are, you know what scale you're going to play, but 
just knowing the scale, which you can play over it, is not enough. That doesn't make a solo. That doesn't make a melodic line. Scales are important, but a scale is not in and of itself a melody. Uh, you can have all the right notes that you've played over uh, a chord, but you have to think about what type of melody is being played, because sometimes the melody is just crap, although all your notes were correct. And so, um, really, I'd say think about that. I hope in the future to make a video talking about exactly that. I call them improv etudes. I have a whole book of them, of uh, and blues and rhythm changes in all keys. There are a whole book uh, full of improv etudes. And also in my book, 250 Jazz Pens, I've included not only a couple of transcribed solos in there, but also a bunch of uh, improv etudes over some standards as well. In any case, I hope in the future to do a video on, on how to create improv etudes if you've never done it before. And uh, I think those who probably maybe have done it find it a very, not only a very useful t uh, tool, but it's probably in somewhat way even maybe revolutionized your playing. I'd say that's my two cents on um, the issue of learning to practice jazz patterns. Please comment, like, subscribe. If you like this video, please press that like button. Please subscribe. Please share it and comment. I'd like to hear from you. And if there's any questions or maybe you know, some other topics that you think I should cover, please let me know that as well. So I'd say thank you very much. Um, this is Evan Tate here tuning out for today and see you in the next video.